Section 1 of Astounding Stories 2, February 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Section 1 of Astounding Stories 2, February 1930. Old Crompton's Secret by Harl Vincent Two miles west of the village of Laketon, there lived an aged recluse who was known only as Old Crompton. As far back as the villagers could remember, he had visited the town regularly twice a month, each time tottering his lonely way homeward with a load of provisions. He appeared to be well supplied with funds, but purchased sparingly as became a miserly hermit and so vicious was his tongue that few cared to converse with him, even the young hoodlums of the town hesitating to harass him with the banter usually accorded the other bizarre characters of the streets. The oldest inhabitants knew nothing of his past history, and they had long since lost their curiosity in the matter. He was a fixture, as was the old town hall with its surrounding park. His lonely cabin was shunned by all who chanced to pass along the old dirt road that led through the woods to nowhere and was rarely used. His only extravagance was in the matter of books, and the village bookstore profited considerably by his purchases. But at the instigation of Cass Harmon, the bookseller, it was whispered about that old Crompton was a believer in the black art, that he had made a pact with the devil himself and was lead with him and his imps. For the books he bought were strange ones, ancient volumes that cast must needs order from New York or Chicago, and that cost as much as ten or even fifteen dollars a copy, translations of the writings of the alchemists and astrologers and philosophers of the Dark Ages. It was no wonder old Crompton was looked at askance by the simple living and deeply religious natives of the small Pennsylvania town. But there came a day when the hermit was to have a neighbor, and the town buzzed with excited speculation as to what would happen. The property across the road from old Crompton's hut belonged to Alton Forsyth, Laketon's wealthiest resident hundreds of acres of scrubby woodland that he considered well-nigh worthless. But Tom Forsyth, his only son, had returned from college and his ambitions were of a nature strange to his townspeople and utterly incomprehensible to his father. Something vague about biology and chemical experiments and the like is what he spoke of, and when his parents objected on the grounds of possible explosions and other weird accidents, he prevailed upon his father to have a secluded laboratory built for him in the woods. When the workman started the small frame structure not a quarter of a mile from his own hut, old Crompton was furious. He raged and stormed, but to no avail. Tom Forsyth had his heart set on the project, and he was somewhat of a successful debater himself. The fire that flashed from his cold gray eyes matched that from the pale blue ones of the elderly anchorite, and the law was on his side. So the building was completed, and Tom Forsyth moved in, bag and baggage. For more than a year the hermit studiously avoided his neighbor, though, truth to tell, this required very little effort. For Tom Forsyth became almost as much of a recluse as his predecessor remaining indoors for days at a time and visiting the home of his people scarcely oftener than old Crompton visited the village. He, too, became the target of village gossip, and his name was ere long linked with that of the old man in similar animate version. But he cared not for the opinions of his townspeople, nor for the dark looks of suspicion that greeted him on his rare appearances in the public places. His chosen work engrossed him so deeply that all else counted for nothing. His parents remonstrated with him in vain. Tom laughed away their recriminations and fears, continuing with his labors more strenuously than ever. He never troubled his mind over the nearness of old Crompton's hut, the existence of which he hardly noticed or considered. It so happened one day that the old man's curiosity got the better of him 
and Tom caught him prowling about on his property, peering wonderingly at the many rabbit hutches, chicken coops, dove coats, and the like, which cluttered the space to the rear of the laboratory. Seeing that he was discovered, the old man wrinkled his face into a toothless grin of conciliation. "'Just looking over your place, Forsyth,' he said. "'Sorry about the fuss I made when you built the house, but I'm an old man, you know, and changes are unwelcome. Now I have forgotten my objections and would like to be friends. Can we?' Tom peered searchingly into the flinty eyes that were set so deeply in the wrinkled, leathery countenance. He suspected an ulterior motive, but could not find it within him to turn the old fellow down. "'Why, I guess so, Crompton,' he hesitated. "'I have nothing against you, but I came here for seclusion, and I'll not have anyone bothering me in my work.' "'I'll not bother you, young man. But I'm fond of pets.' and I see you have many of them here. Guinea pigs, chickens, pigeons, and rabbits. Would you mind if I make friends with some of them?" "'They're not pets,' answered Tom dryly. "'They are material for use in my experiments. But you may amuse yourself with them, if you wish.' "'You mean that you cut them up, kill them, perhaps?' "'Not that. But I sometimes change them in physical form sometimes cause them to become of huge size, sometimes produce pygmy offspring of normal animals. Don't they suffer? Very seldom, though occasionally a subject dies. But the benefit that will accrue to mankind is well worth the slight inconvenience to the dumb creatures and the infrequent loss of their lives. Old Crompton regarded him dubiously. You are trying to find he interrogated. The secret of life! Tom Forsyth's eyes took on the stare of fanaticism. Before I have finished, I shall know the nature of the vital force, how to produce it. I shall prolong human life indefinitely, create artificial life, and the solution is more closely approached with each passing day. The hermit blinked in pretended mystification but he understood perfectly, and he bitterly envied the younger man's knowledge and ability that enabled him to delve into the mysteries of nature which had always been so attractive to his own mind. And somehow he acquired a sudden deep hatred of the coolly confident young man who spoke so positively of accomplishing the impossible. During the winter months that followed, the strange acquaintance progressed but little. Tom did not invite his neighbor to visit him, nor did old Crompton go out of his way to impose his presence on the younger man, though each spoke pleasantly enough to the other on the few occasions when they happened to meet. With the coming of spring they encountered one another more frequently, and Tom found considerable of interest in the quaint, borrowed philosophy of the gloomy old man. Old Crompton, of course, was desperately interested in the things that were hidden in Tom's laboratory but he never requested permission to see them. He hid his real feelings extremely well, and was apparently content to spend as much time as possible with the feathered and furred subjects for experiment, being very careful not to incur Tom's displeasure by displaying too great interest in the laboratory itself. Then there came a day in early summer, when an accident served to draw the two men closer together and old Crompton's long-sought opportunity followed. He was starting for the village, when, from down the road, there came a series of tremendous squawkings, then a bellow of dismay in the voice of his young neighbor. He turned quickly and was astonished at the sight of a monstrous rooster, which had escaped and was headed straight for him with head down and wings fluttering wildly. Tom followed close behind but was unable to catch the darting monster. And monster it was, for this rooster stood no less than three feet in height, and appeared more ferocious than a large turkey. Old Crompton had his shopping bag, a large one of burlap which he always carried to town, and he summoned enough courage to throw it over the head of the screeching, oversized fowl. 
So tangled did the panic-stricken bird become that it was a comparatively simple matter to effect his capture, and the old man rose to his feet triumphant with the bag securely closed over the struggling captive. "'Thanks,' panted Tom when he drew alongside. "'I should never have caught him, and his appearance at large might have caused me a great deal of trouble, now of all times.' "'It's all right, Forsyth,' smirked the old man. "'Glad I was able to do it!' Secretly he gloated, for he knew this occurrence would be an open sesame to that laboratory of Tom's, and it proved to be just that. A few nights later he was awakened by a vigorous thumping at his door, something that had never before occurred during his nearly sixty years' occupancy of the tumble-down hut. The moon was high and he cautiously peeped from the window and saw that his late visitor was none other than young Forsyth. "'With you in a minute!' he shouted, hastily thrusting his rheumatic old limbs into his shabby trousers. "'Now to see the inside of that laboratory!' he chuckled to himself. It required but a moment to attire himself in the scanty raiment he wore during the warm months but he could hear Tom muttering and impatiently pacing the flagstones before his door. "'What is it?' he asked as he drew the bolt and emerged into the brilliant light of the moon. "'Success!' breathed Tom excitedly. "'I have produced growing, living matter synthetically. More than this, I have learned the secret of the vital force, the spark of life. Immortality is within easy reach. Come and see for yourself.' They quickly traversed the short distance to the two-story building which comprised Tom's workshop and living quarters. The entire ground floor was taken up by the laboratory, and old Crompton stared aghast at the wealth of equipment it contained. Furnaces there were, and retorts that reminded him of those pictured in the woodcuts in some of his musty books. Then there were complicated machines, with many levers and dials mounted on their faces and with huge glass bulbs of peculiar shape, with coils of wire connecting to knob-like protuberances of their transparent walls. In the exact center of the great single room there was what appeared to be a dissecting table, with a brilliant light overhead and with two of the odd glass bulbs at either end. It was to this table that Tom led the excited old man. "'This is my perfected apparatus,' said Tom proudly and by its use I intend to create a new race of supermen, men and women who will always retain the vigor and strength of their youth, and who cannot die except by actual destruction of their bodies. Under the influence of the rays all bodily ailments vanish as if by magic, and organic defects are quickly corrected. Watch this now." He stepped to one of the many cages at the side of the room and returned with a wriggling cotton-tail in his hands. Old Compton watched anxiously as he picked a nickeled instrument from a tray of surgical appliances and requested his visitor to hold the protesting animal while he covered its head with a handkerchief. "'Ethyl chloride,' explained Tom, noting with amusement the look of distaste on the old man's face. "'We'll just put him to sleep for a minute while I amputate a leg.' The struggles of the rabbit quickly ceased when the spray soaked the handkerchief and the anesthetic took effect. With a shining scalpel and a surgical saw, Tom speedily removed one of the forelegs of the animal, and then he placed the limp body in the center of the table, removing the handkerchief from its head as he did so. At the end of the table there was a panel with its glittering array of switches and electrical instruments and old Crompton observed very closely the manipulation of the controls as Tom started the mechanism. With the ensuing hum of a motor generator from a corner of the room, the four bulbs adjacent to the table sprang into life, each glowing with a different color and each emitting a different vibratory note as it responded to the energy within. "'Keep an eye on Mr. Rabbit now,' admonished Tom. From the body of the small animal, there emanated an intangible though hazily visible aura as the combined effects of the rays grew in intensity. Old Crompton bent over the table and peered amazedly at the stump of the foreleg, from which blood no longer dripped. The stump was healing over. 
Yes, it seemed to elongate as one watched. A new limb was growing on to replace the old. Then the animal struggled once more, this time to regain consciousness. In a moment it was fully awake, and, with a frightened hop, was off the table and hobbling about in search of a hiding place. Tom Forsyth laughed. Never knew what happened, he exulted, and, excepting for the temporary limp, is not inconvenienced at all. Even that will be gone in a couple of hours, for the new limb will be completely grown by that time. But, but Tom, stammered the old man, this is wonderful. How do you accomplish it? Ha! Don't think I'll reveal my secret. But this much I will tell you. The life force generated by my apparatus stimulates a certain gland that's normally inactive in warm-blooded animals. This gland, when active, possesses the function of growing new members to the body to replace lost ones, in much the same manner as this is done in the case of the lobster and certain other crustaceans. Of course, the process is extremely rapid when the gland is stimulated by the vital rays from my tubes. But this is only one of the many wonders of the process. Here is something far more remarkable. He took from a large glass jar the body of a guinea pig, a body that was rigid in death. This guinea pig, he explained, was suffocated twenty-four hours ago and is stone dead. Suffocated? Yes, but quite painlessly, I assure you. I merely removed the air from the jar with a vacuum pump, and the little creature passed out of the picture very quickly. Now we'll revive it. Old Crompton stretched forth a skinny hand to touch the dead animal, but withdrew it hastily when he felt the clammy rigidity of the body. There was no doubt as to the lifelessness of this specimen. Tom placed the dead guinea pig on the spot where the rabbit had been subjected to the action of the rays. Again his visitor watched carefully as he manipulated the controls of the apparatus. With the glow of the tubes and the ensuing haze of eerie light that surrounded the little body, a marked change was apparent. The inanimate form relaxed suddenly, and it seemed that the muscles pulsated with an accession of energy. Then one leg was stretched forth spasmodically. There was a convulsive heave as the lungs drew in a first long breath and with that an astonished and very much alive rodent scrambled to its feet, blinking wondering eyes in the dazzling light. "'See! See!' shouted Tom, grasping old Crompton by the arm in a vice-like grip. "'It is the secret of life and death! Aristocrats, plutocrats, and beggars will beat a path to my door. But never fear, I shall choose my subjects well.' The name of Thomas Forsyth will yet be emblazoned in the Hall of Fame. I shall be master of the world." Old Crompton began to fear the glitter in the eyes of the gaunt young man who seemed suddenly to have become demented. And his envy and hatred of his talented host blazed anew as Forsyth gloried in the success of his efforts. Then he was struck with an idea, and he affected his most ingratiating manner. "'It is a marvelous thing, Tom,' he said, "'and is entirely beyond my poor comprehension. But I can see that it is all you say and more. Tell me, can you restore the youth of an aged person by these means?' "'Positively!' Tom did not catch the eager note in the old man's voice. Rather, he took the question as an inquiry into the further marvels of his process. Here, he continued enthusiastically, I'll prove that to you also. My dog Spot is around the place somewhere, and he is a decrepit old hound, blind, lame, and toothless. You've probably seen him with me. He rushed to the stairs and whistled. There was an answering yelp from above and the pad of uncertain paws on the bare wooden steps. A dejected old beagle blundered into the room, dragging a crippled hind leg as he fawned upon his master, who stretched forth a hand to pat the unsteady head. "'Guess Spot is old enough for the test,' laughed Tom. "'And I have been meaning to restore him to his youthful vigor anyway. No time like the present!' 
he led his trembling pet to the table of the remarkable tubes and lifted him to its surface. The poor old beast lay trustingly where he was placed, quiet save for his husky, asthmatic breathing. "'Hold him, Crompton,' directed Tom as he pulled the starting lever of his apparatus. And old Crompton watched in fascinated anticipation as the ethereal luminosity bathed the dog's body in response to the action of the four rays. Somewhat vaguely it came to him that the baggy flesh of his own wrinkled hands took on a new firmness and color where they reposed on the animal's back. Young Forsyth grinned triumphantly as Spot's breathing became more regular and the rasp gradually left it. Then the dog whined in pleasure and wagged his tail with increasing vigor. Suddenly he raised his head, perked his ears in astonishment, and looked his master straight in the face with eyes that saw once more. The low throat cry rose to a full and joyous bark. He sprang to his feet from under the restraining hands and jumped to the floor in a lithe-muscled leap that carried him halfway across the room. He capered about with the abandon of a puppy, making extremely active use of four sound limbs. "'Why, why, Forsyth,' stammered the hermit, "'it's absolutely incredible! Tell me, tell me, what is this remarkable force?' His host laughed gleefully. "'You probably wouldn't understand it anyway, but I'll tell you. It's as simple as the nose on your face. The spark of life, the vital force, is merely an extremely complicated electrical manifestation, which I have been able to duplicate artificially. This spark, or force, is all that distinguishes living from inanimate matter and in living beings the force gradually decreases in power as the years pass, causing loss of health and strength. The chemical composition of bones and tissue alters, joints become stiff, muscles atrophied, and bones brittle. By recharging, as it were, the vital force, the gland action is intensified, youth and strength is renewed. By repeating the process every ten or fifteen years, the same degree of vigor can be maintained indefinitely. Mankind will become immortal. That is why I say I am to be master of the world." For the moment old Crompton forgot his jealous hatred in the enthusiasm with which he was imbued. "'Tom! Tom!' he pleaded in his excitement. "'Use me as a subject! Renew my youth! My life has been a sad one and a lonely one, but I would that I might live it over. I should make of it a far different one, something worth while. See, I am ready." He sat on the edge of the gleaming table and made as if to lie down on its gleaming surface. But his young host only stared at him in open amusement. "'What, you?' he sneered unfeelingly. "'Why, you old fossil! I told you, I would choose my subjects carefully. They are to be people of standing and wealth, who can contribute to the fame and fortune of one Thomas Forsyth." "'But, Tom, I have money,' old Crompton begged. But when he saw the hard mirth in the younger man's eyes, his old animosity flamed anew, and he sprang from his position and shook a skinny forefinger in Tom's face. "'Don't do that to me, you old fool!' shouted Tom. "'And get out of here! Think I'd waste current on an old cadger like you? I guess not! Now get out! Get out, I say!' Then the old anchorite saw red. Something seemed to snap in his soured old brain. He found himself kicking and biting and punching at his host, who backed away from the furious onslaught in surprise. Then Tom tripped over a wire and fell to the floor with a force that rattled the windows, his ferocious little adversary on top. The younger man lay still where he had fallen, a trickle of blood showing at his temple. "'My God! I've killed him!' gasped the old man. With trembling fingers he opened Tom's shirt and listened for his heartbeats. Panic-stricken, he rubbed the young man's wrists, slapped his cheeks and ran for water to dash in his face. But all efforts to revive him proved futile, and then, in awful fear, old Crompton dashed into the night, 
the dog Spot snapping at his heels as he ran. Hours later, the stooped figure of a shabby old man might have been seen stealthily re-entering the lonely workshop where the light still burned brightly. Tom Forsyth lay rigid in the position in which old Crompton had left him, and the dog growled menacingly. Averting his gaze and circling wide of the body, old Crompton made for the table of the marvelous rays. In minute detail he recalled every move made by Tom in starting and adjusting the apparatus to produce the incredible results he had witnessed. Not a moment was to be wasted now. Already he had hesitated too long, for soon would come the dawn and possible discovery of his crime. But the invention of his victim would save him from the long arm of the law, for with youth restored, old Crompton would cease to exist, and a new life would open its doors to the starved soul of the hermit. Hermit indeed. He would begin life anew, an active man with youthful vigor and ambition. Under an assumed name he would travel abroad, would enjoy life, and would later become a successful man of affairs. He had enough money, he told himself, and the police would never find old Crompton, the murderer of Tom Forsythe. He deposited his small traveling bag on the floor and fingered the controls of Tom's apparatus. He threw the starting switch confidently and grinned in satisfaction as the answering whine of the motor generator came to his ears. One by one he carefully made the adjustments in exactly the manner followed by the now silenced discoverer of the process. Everything operated precisely as it had during the preceding experiments. Odd that he should have anticipated some such necessity, but something had told him to observe Tom's movements carefully and now he rejoiced in the fact that his intuition had led him aright. Painfully he climbed to the tabletop and stretched his aching body in the warm light of the four huge tubes. His exertions during the struggle with Tom were beginning to tell on him. But the soreness and stiffness of feeble muscles and stubborn joints would soon be but a memory. His pulses quickened at the thought, and he breathed deep in a sudden feeling of unaccustomed well-being. The dog growled continuously from his position at the head of his master, but did not move to interfere with the intruder. And old Crompton, in the excitement of the momentous experience, paid him not the slightest attention. His body tingled from head to foot, with a not unpleasant sensation that conveyed the assurance of radical changes taking place under the influence of the vital rays. The tingling sensation increased in intensity until it seemed that every corpuscle in his veins danced to the tune of the vibration from those glowing tubes that bathed him in an ever-spreading radiance. Aches and pains vanished from his body, but he soon experienced a sharp stab of new pain in his lower jaw. With an experimental forefinger, he rubbed the gum. He laughed aloud as the realization came to him that in those gums where there had been no teeth for more than twenty years there was now growing a complete new set. And the rapidity of the process amazed him beyond measure. The aching area spread quickly and was becoming really uncomfortable. But then, and he consoled himself with the thought, Nothing is brought into being without a certain amount of pain. Besides, he was confident that his discomfort would soon be over. He examined his hand, and found that the joints of two fingers long crippled with rheumatism now moved freely and painlessly. The misty brilliance surrounding his body was paling, and he saw that the flesh was taking on a faint, green fluorescence instead. The race had completed their work and soon the transformation would be fully effected. He turned on his side and slipped to the floor with the agility of a youngster. The dog snarled anew, but kept steadfastly to his position. There was a small mirror over the washstand at the far end of the room, and old Crompton made haste to obtain the first view of his reflected image. His step was firm and springy, his bearing confident and he found that his long stooped shoulder straightened naturally and easily. He felt that he had taken on at least two inches in stature, which was indeed the case. 
When he reached the mirror, he peered anxiously into his dingy surface, and what he saw there so startled him that he stepped backward in amazement. This was not Larry Crompton, but an entirely new man. The straggly white hair had given way to soft, healthy waves of chestnut hue. Gone were the seams from the leathery countenance, and the eyes looked out clearly and steadily from under brows as thick and dark as they had been in his youth. The reflected features were those of an entire stranger. They were not even reminiscent of the Larry Crompton of fifty years ago, but were the features of a far more vigorous and prepossessing individual than he had ever seemed, even in the best years of his life. The jaw was firm, the one sunken cheek so well filled out that his high cheekbones were no longer in evidence. It was the face of a man not more than thirty-eight years of age, reflecting exceptional intelligence and strength of character. "'What a disguise!' he exclaimed in delight. And his voice, echoing in the stillness that followed the switching off of the apparatus, was deep-throated and mellow, the voice of a new man. Now serenely confident that discovery was impossible, he picked up his small but heavy bag and started for the door. Dawn was breaking, and he wished to put as many miles between himself and Tom's laboratory as could be covered in the next few hours. But at the door he hesitated. Then, despite the furious yapping of Spot, he returned to the table of the rays, and, with deliberate thoroughness, smashed the costly tubes which had brought about his rehabilitation. With a pinch bar from a nearby tool rack, he wrecked the controls and generating mechanisms beyond recognition. Now he was absolutely secure. No meddling experts could possibly discover the secret of Tom's invention. All evidence which showed that the young experimenter had met his death at the hands of old Crompton, the despised hermit of West Laketon. But none would dream that the handsome man of means who was henceforth to be known as George Voigt was that same despised hermit. He recovered his satchel and left the scene. With long rapid strides he proceeded down the old dirt road toward the main highway, where, instead of turning east into the village, he would turn west and walk to Kernsburg, the neighboring town. There, in not more than two hours' time, his new life would really begin. Had you, a visitor, departed from Laketon when old Crompton did, and returned twelve years later, you would have noticed very little difference in the appearance of the village. The old town hall and the little park were the same, the dingy brick building among the trees being just a little dingier and its wooden steps more worn and sagged. The main street showed evidence of recent repaving, and in consequence of the resulting increase in through automobile traffic, there were two new gasoline filling stations in the heart of the town. Down the road about a half mile there was a new building, which, upon inquiring from one of the natives, would be proudly designated as the new high school building. Otherwise there were no changes to be observed. In his dilapidated chair in the untidy office he had occupied for nearly thirty years sat Asa Culkin, popularly known as Judge Culkin. Justice of the Peace, Sheriff, Attorney at Law, and three times Mayor of Lakedon, he was still a controlling factor in local politics and government. And many a knotty legal problem was settled in that gloomy little office. Many a dispute in the town council was dependent for arbitration upon the keen mind and understanding wit of the old judge. The four o'clock train had just puffed its labored way from the station when a stranger entered his office a stranger of uncommonly prosperous air. The keen blue eyes of the old attorney appraised him instantly, and classified him as a successful man of business, not yet forty years of age, and with a weighty problem on his mind. "'What can I do for you, sir?' he asked, removing his feet from the battered desktop. "'You may be able to help me a great deal, Judge,' was the unexpected reply. "'I came to Laketon to give myself up.' Give yourself up? Culkin rose to his feet in surprise and unconsciously straightened his shoulders in the effort to seem less dwarfed before the tall stranger. 
Why, what do you mean? he inquired. I wish to give myself up for murder, answered the amazing visitor, slowly and with decision. For a murder committed twelve years ago. I should like you to listen to my story first, though. It has been kept too long. But I still do not understand. There was puzzlement in the honest old face of the attorney. He shook his gray locks in uncertainty. Why should you come here? Why come to me? What possible interest can I have in the matter? Just this, Judge. You do not recognize me now, and you will probably consider my story incredible when you hear it. But when I have given you all the evidence, you will know who I am and will be compelled to believe. The murder was committed in Lakedon. This is why I came to you. A murder in Lakedon? Twelve years ago? Again the aged attorney shook his head. But proceed. Yes, I killed Thomas Forsythe. The stranger looked for an expression of horror in the features of his listener, but there was none. Instead the benign countenance took on a look of deepening amazement, but the smile wrinkles had somehow vanished and the old face was grave in its surprised interest. "'You seem astonished,' continued the stranger. "'Undoubtedly you were convinced that the murderer was Larry Crompton, old Crompton the hermit. He disappeared the night of the crime and has never been heard from since. Am I correct?' "'Yes, he disappeared all right. But continue.' Not by a lift of his eyebrow did Culkin betray his disbelief, but the stranger sensed that his story was somehow not as startling as it should have been. You will think me crazy, I presume, but I am old Crompton, and it was my hand that fell the unfortunate young man in his laboratory out there in West Lakedon twelve years ago tonight. It was his marvelous invention that transformed the old hermit into the apparently young man you see before you. But I swear that I am none other than Larry Crompton and that I killed young Forsythe. I am ready to pay the penalty. I can bear the flagellation of my own conscience no longer." The visitor's voice had risen to the point of hysteria, but his listener remained calm and unmoved. Now, just let me get this straight," he said quietly. Do I understand that you claim to be old Crompton, rejuvenated in some mysterious manner, and that you killed Tom Forsyth on that night twelve years ago? Do I understand that you wish now to go on trial for that crime and to pay the penalty? Yes, yes, and the sooner the better. I can stand it no longer. I am the most miserable man in the world. Hmm, hmm, muttered the judge. This is strange. He spoke soothingly to his visitor. Do not upset yourself, I beg of you. I will take care of this thing for you, never fear. Just take a seat, Mr. Er. You may call me Voigt for the present, said the stranger in a more composed tone of voice. George Voigt. This is the name I have been using since the. since that fatal night. Very well, Mr. Voigt, replied the counselor with an air of greatest solicitude. Please have a seat now while I make a telephone call. And George Voigt slipped into a stiff backed chair with a sigh of relief. For he knew the judge from the old days, and he was now certain that his case would be disposed of very quickly. With a telephone receiver pressed to his ear, Culkin repeated a number. The stranger listened intently during the ensuing silence. Then there came a muffled, hello, sounding in impatient response to the call. "'Hello, Alton,' spoke the attorney. "'This is Asa speaking. A stranger has just stepped into my office, and he claims to be old Crompton. Remember the hermit across the road from your son's old laboratory? Well, this man, who bears no resemblance whatever to the old man he claims to be, and seems to be less than half the age of Tom's old neighbor, says that he killed Tom on that night we remember so well." There were some surprised remarks from the other end of the wire, but Voigt was unable to catch them. 
he was in a cold perspiration at the thought of meeting his victim's father. "'Why, yes, Alton,' continued Calkin. "'I think there is something in this story, although I cannot believe it all. But I wish you would accompany us and visit the laboratory. Will you?' "'Lord, man, not that!' interrupted the judge's visitor. "'I can hardly bear to visit the scene of my crime, and in the company of Alton Forsyth. Please, not that!' "'Now you just let me take care of this, young man,' replied the judge testily. Then once more speaking into the mouthpiece of the telephone. "'All right, Alton. We'll pick you up at your office in five minutes.' He replaced the receiver on its hook and turned again to his visitor. "'Please be so kind as to do exactly as I request,' he said. "'I want to help you, but there is more to this thing than you know, and I want you to follow unquestioningly where I lead and ask no questions at all for the present. Things may turn out differently than you expect.' "'All right, Judge.' The visitor resigned himself to whatever might transpire under the guidance of the man he had called upon to turn him over to the officers of the law. Seated in the judge's ancient motor-car, they stopped at the office of Alton Forsyth a few minutes later, and were joined by that red-faced and pompous old man. Few words were spoken during the short run to the well-remembered location of Tom's laboratory, and the man who was known as George Voigt caught at his own throat with nervous fingers when they passed the tumble-down remains of the hut in which old Crompton had spent so many years. With a screeching of well-worn brakes the car stopped before the laboratory, which was now almost hidden behind a mass of shrubs and flowers. "'Easy now, young man,' cautioned the judge, noting the look of fear which had clouded his new client's features. The three men advanced to the door through which old Crompton had fled on that night of horror twelve years before. The elder Forsyth spoke not a word as he turned the knob and stepped within. Voigt shrank from entering, but soon mastered his feelings and followed the other two. The sight that met his eyes caused him to cry aloud in awe. At the dissecting table, which seemed to be exactly as he had seen it last, but with replicas of the tubes he had destroyed once more in place, stood Tom Forsyth. Considerably older, and with hair prematurely gray, he was still the young man old Crompton thought he had killed. Tom Forsyth was not dead after all, and all of his years of misery had gone for nothing. He advanced slowly to the side of the wondering young man, Alton Forsyth, and Asa Culkin watching silently from just inside the door. "'Tom! Tom!' spoke the stranger. "'You are alive? You were not dead when I left you on that terrible night when I smashed your precious tubes? Oh, it is too good to be true! I can scarcely believe my eyes!' He stretched forth trembling fingers to touch the body of the young man to assure himself that it was not all a dream. Why, said Tom Forsyth in astonishment, I do not know you, sir. Never saw you in my life. What do you mean by your talk of smashing my tubes, of leaving me for dead? Mean? The stranger's voice rose now. He was growing excited. Why, Tom, I am old Crompton. Remember the struggle, here in this very room? You refuse to rejuvenate an unhappy old man with your marvelous apparatus, a temporarily insane old man, Crompton. I was that old man, and I fought with you. You fell striking your head. There was blood. You were unconscious. Yes, for many hours I was sure you were dead, and that I had murdered you. But I had watched your manipulations of the apparatus, and I subjected myself to the action of the rays. My youth was miraculously restored. I became as you see me now. Detection was impossible, for I looked no more like old Crompton than you do. I smashed your machinery to avoid suspicion. Then I escaped, and for twelve years I have thought myself a murderer. I have suffered the tortures of the damned." Tom Forsyth advanced on this remarkable visitor with clenched fists. Staring him in the eyes with cold appraisal, his wrath was all too apparent. The dog Spot, young as ever, entered the room, 
and upon observing the stranger set up an ominous growling and snarling. At least the dog recognized him. "'What are you trying to do? Catechize me? Are you another of these alienists my father has been bringing around?' The young inventor was furious. "'If you are,' he continued, "'you can get out of here now. I'll have no more of this meddling with my affairs. I'm as sane as any of you, and I refuse to submit to this continual persecution.' The elder Forsyth grunted, and Culkin laid a restraining hand on his arm. "'Just a minute now, Tom,' he said soothingly. "'This stranger is no alienist. He has a story to tell. Please permit him to finish.' Somewhat mollified, Tom Forsythe shrugged his assent. Tom, continued the stranger, more calmly now, what I have said is the truth. I shall prove it to you. I'll tell you things no mortals on earth could know but we two. Remember the day I captured the big rooster for you, the monster you had created? Remember the night you awakened me and brought me here in the moonlight? Remember the rabbit whose leg you amputated and regrew, the poor guinea pig you had suffocated and whose life you restored. Spot here? Don't you remember rejuvenating him? I was here. And you refused to use your process on me, old man that I was. Then is when I went mad and attacked you. Do you believe me, Tom? Then a strange thing happened. While Tom Forsythe gazed in growing belief, the stranger's shoulders sagged, and he trembled as with the ague. The two older men who were kept in the background gasped their astonishment as his hair faded to a sickly gray, then became as white as the driven snow. Old Crompton was reverting to his previous state. Within five minutes, instead of the handsome young stranger, there stood before them a bent, withered old man, Old Crompton beyond a doubt. The effects of Tom's process were spent. "'Well, I'm damned!' ejaculated Alton Forsyth. "'You have been right all along, Asa. And I am mighty glad I did not commit Tom as I intended. He has told us the truth all these years, and we were not wise enough to see it.' "'We!' exclaimed the judge. "'You, Alton Forsyth, I have always upheld him.' and you have done your son a grave injustice, and you owe him your apologies, if ever a father owed his son anything. You are right, Asa. And, his aristocratic pride forgotten, Alton Forsyth rushed to the side of his son and embraced him. The judge turned to old Crompton pityingly. Rather a bad ending for you, Crompton, he said. Still, it is better by far than being branded as a murderer. Better? Better? croaked old Crompton. It is wonderful, Judge. I have never been so happy in my life. The face of the old man beamed, though scalding tears coursed down the withered and seamed cheeks. The two Forsyths looked up from their demonstrations of peacemaking to listen to the amazing words of the old hermit. Yes, happy for the first time in my life, he continued. I am one hundred years of age, gentlemen, and I now look it and feel it. That is as it should be. And my experience has taught me a final lasting lesson. None of you know it, but when I was but a very young man, I was bitterly disappointed in love. <laughs> Never think to look at me now, would you? But I was, and it ruined my entire life. I had a little money, inherited, and I traveled about the world for a few years, then settled in that old hut across the road where I buried myself for sixty years, becoming crabbed and sour and despicable. Young Tom here was the first bright spot, and, though I admired him, I hated him for his opportunities, hated him for that which he had that I had not. With the promise of his invention, I thought I saw happiness, a new life for myself. I got what I wanted, though not in the way I had expected. And I want to tell you, gentlemen, that there is nothing in it. With developments of modern science, you may be able to restore a man's youthful vigor of body, 
but you can't cure his mind with electricity. Though I had a youthful body, my brain was the brain of an old man. Memories were there which could not be suppressed. Even had I not had the fancied death of young Tom on my conscience, I should still have been miserable. I worked, God how I worked, to forget. But I could not forget. I was successful in business and made a lot of money. I am more independent, probably wealthier than you, Alton Forsyth, but that did not bring happiness. I longed to be myself once more, to have the aches and pains which had been taken from me. It is natural to age and to die. Immortality would make of us a people of restless misery. We would quarrel and bicker and long for death, which would not come to relieve us. Now it is over for me, and I am glad, glad, glad." He paused for breath, looking beseechingly at Tom Forsyth. Tom, he said, I suppose you have nothing for me in your heart but hatred, and I don't blame you. But I wish, I wish you would try and forgive me. Can you? The years had brought increased understanding and tolerance to young Tom. He stared at old Crompton, and the long-nursed anger over the destruction of his equipment melted into a strange mixture of pity and admiration for the courageous old fellow. "'Why, I guess I can, Crompton,' he replied. "'There was many a day when I struggled hopelessly to reconstruct my apparatus, cursing you with every bit of energy in my make-up. I could cheerfully have throttled you, had you been within reach. For twelve years I have labored incessantly to reproduce the results we obtained on the night of which you speak. People called me insane. Even my father wished to have me committed to an asylum. And, until now, I have been unsuccessful. Only today has it seemed for the first time that the experiments will again succeed. But my ideas have changed with regard to the uses of the process. I was a cocksure young pup in the old days, with foolish dreams of fame and influence. But I have seen the error of my ways. Your experience, too, convinces me that immortality may not be as desirable as I thought. But there are great possibilities in the way of relieving the sufferings of mankind, and in making this a better world in which to live. With your advice and help, I believe I can do great things. I now forgive you freely, and I ask you to remain here with me to assist in the work that is to come. What do you say to the idea? At the reverent thankfulness in the pale eyes of the broken old man, who had so recently been a perfect specimen of vigorous youth, Alton Forsyth blew his nose noisily. The little judge smiled benevolently and shook his head, as if to say, I told you so. Tom and old Crompton gripped hands mightily. End of Section 1 of Astounding Stories 2, February 1930